Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the online chapters open forum meeting. We hold these meetings every other every odd month on the third Wednesday of the month at 8:30 Eastern Time, and we try to cover topics that are suggested by you. Or if you don't suggest any, then we have to dream up our own. Tonight we were supposed to have a special guest, Alan Holsworth, and he unfortunately is having health issues and was not able to join us tonight. So we're very fortunate that Howard Johnson agreed at the very, very last minute, uh, which was when we asked him, <laughs> not because he was our last choice, actually, he was my first choice, but just because uh, that's when we found out about Alan. So uh, he said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. What, the main topic that we want to cover today. So in our open forum meetings, we normally start with a specific topic. And then as soon as and we talk about that for about 20 minutes, and as soon as the presenter's finished, you're welcome to ask questions either about the presentation or about anything at all that has anything even remotely to do with investing in stocks or better investing or anything else. So we welcome your your questions, your comments. And the other thing we welcome is for everyone to participate. So if you know the answer to a question, just because you're not in the education committee or you're not the speaker, feel free to share with the group what what your experience has been. So if you feel that you can contribute to somebody else's question, please do. That's the strength of this wonderful group. And uh, we do have to give our standard disclaimer which uh, we may tonight talk about specific stocks. And if we do, we are just talking about them for educational purposes. We are not recommending that you buy a stock. Part of the joy of being in better investing is that you'll go ahead and do your own research and decide whether or not the stock that we may have talked about, maybe one person loves it, maybe someone works at that company, maybe someone feels they have some great information about that company, the joy of better investing is you're going to go home and research that company for yourself and not just take anything that we say at face value. I want to also, um, a lot of our group is traveling today. We normally, uh, the members of the education committee are Sriram Malabushi, myself, Chris McCarran. Um, I try to do it alphabetically. That's how I get myself mixed up. <laughs> uh, Dan Perlman and Phil Suter and Dan and Sriram are traveling today. They're both, I think, on airplanes even as we speak. But luckily, Phil is joining us today, and he's going to be helping to field questions at the end of the presentation. Phil, is there anything that you want to say before we introduce Howard to them and uh, get him get him going? Just hi and welcome. Thank you, Howard. I don't have a a bio prepared for you. I just know that you're incredibly experienced and every question I ever have, you either know the answer or you know who to ask. And so uh, I know you do a lot of great things for better investing and with better investing. Do you have like a quick introduction of, for yourself that you'd like to give us? And also, do you have any slides or should I just take this down? I do have some slides. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I, I uh, took a PowerPoint presentation and kind of adapted it for this. Let me see if I can share my screen. And if you also want to put your, your camera on, well, then we could see you. I say that, I don't even have my own. But I'm, have I'm in, in Florida and I'm not appropriately dressed for a display. <laughs> All right, sir. Well, you know better than we do. <laughs> Tell us on the beach and make us uh, really jealous. Well, not on the beach, but I'm in Pensacola, so I'm not too far from the beach. Um, oh, bio. I've been a member of Better Investing since the year 2000, and I've uh, been a director of the Georgia chapter since 2003. And I think I've been a director of the online chapter since it started and I've forgotten how old it is. It's been, what, five or six years now, or four or five? I, I think it's six years, but I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not sure, time flies when you're having fun. 
Um, right. And I won't go into all of the other hats I wear, but uh, we were talking, going to talk about uh, some common uh, portfolio management uh, mistakes and things to look out for. And I found this presentation in the uh, PowerPoints and volunteer services. So I adapted it and uh, it was originally uh, put together by Carol Thine of the Puget Sound chapter. And uh, so when we said we're not making investment recommendations of any stocks we look at, this was put together, I think in 2015 and I've updated some of the areas, but not all. So uh, I think uh, Costco is one of the screens it shows and uh, Starbucks, but the information is probably seven or eight years old. So uh, that's another reason not to go by what you see here, but to do your own uh, stock studies at any time you consider in doing a stock purchase. Uh, Chris did our uh, disclaimer, and uh, I'm still going to work in some portfolio management ideas throughout this, but uh, this presentation is on one of the toughest decisions to make, and this is common among most investment clubs that I've ever done a visit to. They have a problem deciding when to sell. And this goes over some uh, uh, kind of basic reasons. Number one, you need the money. And this is for a club or your individual portfolio. To uh, increase your diversification or to rebalance your portfolio, one of the stocks in your, one or more of the stocks in your portfolio has declining fundamentals and not meeting your expectations. Uh, there's some significant bad news, long-term bad news that has come out about the company. Uh, you realize that the stock is overvalued and to improve portfolio uh, future potential return. If you need the money, it could be for personal reasons, or if you're in a club, it could be for a memo withdrawal. Uh, a lot of people have plans for their personal for portfolio to uh, pay for their children or grandchildren's college, uh, save up for a home, down payment on a home, or pay your home in full, really, uh, to buy land, go on a world cruise, uh, different things like that. And, uh, the tougher decision as to uh, when to sell might be what to sell. So you have to look at your portfolio and pick out those candidates that you feel uh, fit that your uh, criteria. To diversification or to rebalance uh, stock as a percentage of portfolio when you get overweighted in one stock or one industry, you might want to rebalance and sell some of those that are overweighted uh, in your portfolio or overweighted uh, in a particular sector uh, to improve your diversification by company size and to improve the overall growth rate of your portfolio. Hey, this is a, a chart of a portfolio and kind of the uh, summary data in the uh, online tools. And this is an old screenshot of the online tools, but you look at that middle column and that shows the percentage of the portfolio. And this portfolio is pretty well balanced, except down near the bottom, you know, you got some kind of underweighted positions in your portfolio, less than 2% for those last four companies there. So you might want to consider either adding to those positions or liquidating those positions 
if you are not planning to invest more money in them or if they are uh, not meeting your criteria. You can see a couple of them are in the hold zone and a couple are in the buy zone. So those in the hold zone, you might want to take a look at and see if they're worth uh, hanging on to. Hey, in that uh, grain also, uh, you determine what your equal weight or the number of stocks you have. You divide 100 by the number of stocks. This one had uh, 19, so your average weight for each of those 19, about 5.3% of your portfolio. So you do a reasonable range for each one of them and you either multiply them by 0.5 or by 1.5 times. So the smallest holding threshold you should have is like 2.63%. So if you got anything under that, like I said, you might want to consider selling. And uh, then your top uh, threshold, if you have anything that makes up more than 7.89% of your portfolio, you might want to consider taking some profits out of that stock. Uh, reducing your position in that stock. Uh, you got this uh, reasonable range for the uh, 12 members and it shows what percentage each of those uh, uh, stocks hold. So you can make your own conclusions there. Those are above that uh, high water mark of 7.89 and the others are below that small entry level of 2.63. So you have to do a little bit of math to figure all of that out for your portfolio. Okay, what to do about imbalance? Sell all if significantly overvalued. And uh, <laughs> profit is not a dirty word, which is true. You can sell a portion if not significantly overvalued, uh, at the least don't add to that position. And the small holdings, understand why a small holding, a spinoff, a uh, building position, or uh, significant price decline is the reason that it's small. Sell all if not a quality stock and add to the position if it's a quality stock. Like I was saying on the summary report, if you had a buy uh, rating on your stock selection guide, you might wanna add to that position for those uh, small holdings. That doesn't mean small companies, that's just small holdings as a percentage of your portfolio. Okay, this is a diverse, oh, let me go back. Diversification uh, by your industries. And looking at this, you can see which ones that make up a large percentage of your portfolio, consumer defensive, consumer cyclical, and healthcare are the three that make up probably, what, about 65% of your portfolio. And then the others make up that other 35%. Uh, so you might want to consider reducing your holdings in those three categories. Now, these are just things to look at. These are not hard and fast rules, but these are things to consider when you're looking at uh, your portfolio as a whole. So here it's uh, the re uh, rebalance in the same industry. Do you sell one? Uh, do you uh, keep the best out of the uh, ones that are uh, about the same percentage of your portfolio? Uh, some people like certain sectors of the market. They understand that sector of the market and they feel comfortable with an increased weight in that sector. But uh, I guess for clubs, it's best to diversify 
in those uh, different sectors and not be overly weighted in any one. But on an individual basis, sometimes it's justified if, if that's your knowledge base. But you still don't want to get too overweighted because uh, anything happens in that sector, it can take your portfolio way down. You can uh, incur a significant loss. Well, and Howard, that uh, that theory applies to both clubs and individuals, and I think I would I would submit that that's a fantastic opportunity um, to challenge each one and then see you know run, you know go through the, the the different club members and then have a vote at the end of which one to keep because that that makes for a great discussion or comparison. And I was going to mention that you can put them on a comparison guide and and examine them side by side. So that's a great suggestion. Okay, uh, size diversification. Now, <laughs> tell you how old this was. This is one of the screens I had to update because for the small companies, it has it had sales less than 500 million. So I had to go in there and adjust this. I think this is the current uh, BI uh, breakdown. If it's under a billion in sales, it's considered a small company. One billion to 10 billion uh, is considered a uh, medium company. And over 10 billion in sales is considered a large company. And BI recommendation, is to have 25% of your portfolio in small, 50% in medium, and 25% in large. And this is a, another example by uh, the, the sales growth. In your uh, fast growing companies, you look for a revenue growth rate above 12%, and you uh, medium growing companies, you look for a sales increase percentage of eight to 12%. And in your slow uh, revenue growth companies, it can be uh, 7% or less. And uh, in this particular portfolio, it shows the percentage that you have 73% uh, are large. And it kind of coincides with the uh, large, medium, and small uh, characterization too, because the fast is usually the growth rate associated or what you like to see in a small company. You like to see their sales growing at 12% or more. And in this portfolio, it, they only make up 2%. The medium make up 25%, which is uh, about half of what the target is. And then the slow a large company is about three times what the target is. So <clears throat> this, this is what I call an upside down portfolio. But uh, there are some clubs that are structured like this and uh, we always try to encourage them to diversify a little more. But in my visits, I, I come across more clubs that are structured like this than actually trying to meet the 25, 50, 25 uh, breakdown. <coughs> third, excuse me. Third reason to sell is declining fundamentals, not meeting your expectations. Now, when I uh, visit clubs, one suggestion I make to them is that when they buy a new company, and the notes on the uh, SSG include your reasons for buying this stock. You know, if you, your reason is that uh, you projected them to grow sales at 15% and EPS at a certain percentage, write those in the notes so that uh, you can go back and see whether this stock is meeting your expectations. And then if they're not, then you look to see if you've got enough reason to uh, sell. Excuse me. And the tools, 
uh, use the stock selection guide uh, to determine whether they're meeting the fundamentals and then the quarterly trend report known as the PERT A and then the PERT report. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on all of the reports. Uh, I think we know how to look at a stock selection guide and, and do those kind of things. This is what I meant. This is a, a SSG on uh, Costco. And I think it was what the actual data was through 2014 and they were projecting out to 2019. So this is uh, very old information. So, uh, you know, don't go out and, and buy Costco based on this. But uh, it reiterates that uh, we're looking for companies that meet this characteristics on the graph of uh, up straight and parallel. You know, they are, they are increasing in both sales, uh, pre-tax profit and earnings per share. So that's a good example of, of one of those companies that uh, looks good on a stock selection guide. And we know what these are. Uh, we've got some wavy lines and we've got some uh, very uh, cyclical companies. We've got some companies that don't show much in the area of growth rate. And then we've got a company over here, sales are flat and pre-tax profit and earnings per share are on the downtrend. So that those are examples of declining fundamentals that you can see on the stock selection guide. So this is another example where the, uh, in the first one, the sales are flattening out. And then this is the uh, declining uh, trends shown on your quarterly growth trend, the PERT A, you know, we can all look at these lines and tell that it's it's coming down from where it was back in where it was this uh, September of 2011. So these are examples of how you can uh, look at your available tools and the online tools and identify decline in uh, fundamentals on your hurt report. You want to look at all of these uh, areas that have the, uh, I call it the pink shading that indicates uh, declining uh, fundamentals, uh, uh, projections that uh, are well, actual numbers that are not meeting the numbers that you projected the growth rates to be. And then in the, on the, uh, Right side, you've got these uh, yellow ones that uh, bear taking a look at. Okay, uh, significant long-term bad news. They they use this uh, uh, for uh, an example for Microsoft, and. Um, is is just to look at these and and say whether you think this is uh, good news or bad news. You got uh, a new CEO who had success at another company and uh, decline of PC uh, sales and uh, Windows 8, Surface and uh, phone not successful. And then these are what some of the uh, bullish statements are and what some of the bearish statements are. So uh, you can look at those and make your judgment as to whether this is good or uh, bad news. I haven't read these, so I'm not gonna offer a, a conclusion on that. Uh, anybody familiar with this situation from back then and wanna offer a, a uh, Judgment. Nope. Okay. 
will proceed. Overpriced, taking profits is a good thing. Uh, if you love the company, you can always buy it back again at a lower price. Uh, consider selling at least a portion and always consider the uh, tax consequences. Uh, the tools you can use, uh, looking at SSG signals, the high current PE, whether the current PE is uh, higher than uh, the average PE and things like that. An upside downside ratio less than one and low potential return less than 5%. Uh, I like uh, that number two up there. Uh, I, I have visited clubs where the, uh, you know, you assign one of the club members to follow a stock and, and they'll get assigned that stock and They'll follow it, and when it comes time to rotate, they don't want to rotate. They want to keep that stock because they love it. So uh, you have to be careful with that. You want to rotate your uh, assignments at least every two years and, and sometimes every year to give everybody a chance to look at and follow different companies and get different perspective on different industries and things like that. So I kind of recommend you, you do it at least every two years. Uh, every year, depending on how many members you have, might be a little difficult, but at least every two years, they can go through uh, four quarters of following a company and get a good idea of what that company is all about. And then it might be time to switch over. I agree, Howard. Uh, one of the things that we've always heard is don't ever fall in love with a stock. Um, it's, it's good to have different perspectives and, and to compare things. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, even even your your uh, runaway winners, you know, over time, it's good to take some profits because at some point, you know, things go up, but things can definitely come down too. That's very true. Uh... But, you know, as, as far as the falling in love, sometimes you just can't help it. But uh, we have to rescue those people. <laughs> and, and well, we're, we're all part of that population at some point or another, right? I, that's what I was going to ask if anybody in the audience had ever fallen in love with a company. And I think the, the answer would probably be 80% or higher as to a, a yes, affirmative. If, if they're being honest, some of us will just say, well, we can't confirm and we can't deny it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We, we, we're not going to confirm or deny. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, overpriced. Uh, if you're in the sales zone, you've got an upside downside of 0.1 to 1. Is that acceptable? And my answer would be no. And uh, your uh, potential return based on the high PE or the average PE is 3.5% uh, for the high and 2% for the low. Is that an acceptable return for your portfolio when we're trying to get uh, a 15% overall return on our investment? So I would say that would be a no also. A Boeing company. Uh, this is the value line for Boeing company. And uh, the uh, recent price and the projected low price are in the same price range. And the question is, does this leave room for acceptable future price appreciation potential? I would say no. <laughs> if you're projected price and your low price are right there together. I, I'd like to see what the uh, upside downside ratio on this would be also. Is the uh, low projected annual total return of 2% acceptable? Nope. And historically, the low projection is the most likely outcome. And uh, when I'm doing an SSG, 
I kind of uh, bank on that low projection, just like I do when I make my growth projections, I err on the side of being conservative. So if I, you know, making my projections and it comes out to like, I think honestly, it probably is 15, I might give it a 12, a 12 or a 13, probably a 13. So I like to project on the low side. And when I look at that backside and potential return, uh, if that low one is in the uh, 13 or 14 percent and the high one is like 19 or 20 percent, I feel comfortable with that 13 or 14 percent. Okay, this is uh, Starbucks. And uh, the note on this, if you look up here, see that, that dot, and it's above the trend line for Starbucks. And if it's, uh, if, if it's above that trend line, that means that the uh, is an indication of the stock being overvalued. Hey, to improve your uh, portfolio potential future return, that's another reason to sell a company. Look for the lowest potential returns and consider replacement. And this is where I was going to mention the stock comparison guide and assist in uh, decision making process. Uh, and it also applies to the other example when we were talking about comparing uh, companies in the same sector that might be equally weighted in your portfolio. If you want to get one of those, you can also use the uh, stock comparison guide in those situations. Okay, this is a, a summary report and you see these price dates are back in December of 2014. So they probably all out of whack now, but uh, it's sorted by your percentage total return estimates. And you see, they've got a cutoff down here at like 5%, but you see for most of these, you got one hole and then the rest of these have sale recommendations associated with them. So that's kind of help you to identify some potential uh, sale candidates in your portfolio. Once again, now this is uh, not a hard and fast rule. This is just an indicator that you might want to take a look at these. And when I do portfolio reviews, uh, I I kind of well. Let me take that back. We don't do we don't call them reviews. We call them portfolio discussions these days because a review they say uh, tends to indicate that you're going to make a recommendation. So we call them discussions, a little back and forth exchange. And this is what the old comparison guide looked like. And you can line up and you can see what the comparison is with each one of the companies as far as the categories that they look at. Now on the live uh, version of this, uh, you can uh, select it where the highest percentage or highest growth rate or the highest number in each category might be uh, highlighted. And then it will give you a count up here at the top of those highlighted areas. And that's just a quick and dirty way of trying to see which companies uh, have the best figures among the this, these five companies. But now you have to look at uh, all of those categories because some of them, the highest number is not a uh, positive number. It's, it's, it's high, but it's an indicator of negative performance. So like if, uh, if you had percentage debt, you know, one might get highlighted for having 65% debt to capital, and that's not a good percentage. So 
Uh, not all of them like that, but every now and then one of them will be something that is a negative indicator. So be careful with that count. And uh, you can uh, indicate on the current uh, comparison guide which categories you want tabulated that way and which ones you don't. And uh, on the new comparison guide, you can also save them. So uh, that's a, a big improvement on the way it used to be. Okay, this is uh, portfolios that you can put in your uh, online tools. You can create these portfolios and you can select this uh, portfolio summary report. And I think that's what we've been looking at on some of the other uh, reports there, what the old portfolio summary report would look like with those uh, percentages of the portfolio and then the buy, hold, and sell recommendations on the right. Those were portfolio summary reports. Okay, hey, bad reasons for not selling emotional or psychological attachment. We talked about that. You hate to take a loss. You want to take a small loss now. You want to take a bigger loss later. You hate to admit to a mistake in the purchase. That goes along the same uh, uh, reasoning. Do you want to admit to a mistake now and get out with minimum loss? Or do you want to hold on and, and uh, admit a mistake after you suffered a big loss? So uh, just bear that in mind when, you, when you're thinking about taking a loss. And one thing I've learned is that sometimes, uh, especially in the club or in your individual portfolio, you'll sell at a loss to offset a capital gain uh, for tax reasons. So uh, sometimes it, it works to your advantage. And remember the uh, rule of five of the five stocks you purchase is likely that one will outperform, three will do as expected, and one will underperform. And I found that to be uh, true in my investing uh, uh, history. Now, this is a, a review of the reasons to sell. You need the money to diversify or rebalance. Stock has declining fundamentals, significant long-term bad news. The stock is overvalued or to improve your portfolio future potential return. Hey, if better investing has made a difference in your life, share your story with somebody else and uh, introduce others to the same opportunity that you've taken advantage of. And that's very important. Now, that completes my brief discussion. Any questions? I know I didn't explain it that well, so I know there are questions out there. Well, there was a standard question that was written into the messages that uh, are the slides going to be available. And I'm going to confirm with Chris, but generally what happens is they get uploaded to the website after the meeting. Is that going to, is that true, Chris? That is true. And you know, Phil, I, you just asking me that question made me realize that I completely forgot to live stream it on Facebook. So okay. that, that's unfortunate, but I will put on Facebook the, you know, the link to uh, where you can find the recording and the slides after the presentation. Very great. All right. I think that was the only question I saw come through. Um, Actually, Phil, can I interrupt again? Sorry. Sure. Uh, I also want to mention that we do have our own YouTube channel. The online chapter has it has a YouTube channel, and you'll find lots of great content there, including all of these presentations. So while while uh, you're talking and 
uh, we're you know continuing with our discussion, I'll go ahead and put that link into the chat. Uh, and Phil, I know that uh, prior to our starting the meeting, there was a question that came through about uh, transferring, you know, not related to this to the presentation, which. Howard, I just want to say what a fantastic job you did in like the last hour that you had to put this together. <laughs> really, <laughs> you're my idol. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I always enjoyed, you know, making club visits and doing presentations. Uh, although it, it, this, one, this one has been a challenge. <laughs> I, I hope I, I kind of met a minimum standard. <laughs> Very no, this is great information. I thought you did a great job, Howard. Thank you. Uh, there was another question, um, and I'm trying to understand this one, so I might need some help. But the question was, how does someone add multiple studies to one portfolio? Um, you can do studies on different um, holdings in your portfolio. You'd have to do them separate. And I think, I'm not sure if this question is asking, once you've done your studies on the individual companies, that's when you can do your comparison. So you have to have your studies completed before you can do the comparison. But if I'm missing that, um, kind of clarify that if you would, please. Okay. Uh, now, one thing I, I think is true is that, uh, you you don't have to have completed your SSG to do a comparison. It will enter the basic information on that company, but it will not have a judgment value. You know, those four judgments that we make on the stock selection guide, those will be blank because it'll just go out to Morningstar where we get our information and it'll populate it for that company, but it'll just populate the rep, the raw data, and it won't have uh, forecast earnings growth and forecast sales growth and uh, your selected high PE and your selected low PE and, and that kind of thing. But I think it will fill in all of those other areas. Now to do, to create your portfolio, you will have to have a completed uh, stock selection guide. And I'm wondering if he mean by multiple studies, like if he's done uh, a study on Microsoft and then he went back and did another study on Microsoft with different judgments, you can, you can use both of those, you can add both of those to a portfolio, but you have to name them different. Okay, there was a follow up. I don't know. Uh, let's see if this helps. So on the portfolios and the studies, they have too many studies mixed. Is there a way to pick a few at the same time and create like a when to sell portfolio? Um, that one, um, I'm having trouble understanding. Yeah, uh, I don't know why you'd want to have a when to sell portfolio, kind of like the list that you had shown, though, if you're going to sort these on total return or whatever, and you're uh, right, some of your your stocks falls at the bottom, that's that's your when to sell list. Yeah, uh, sort it, sort it by total return and. Or you can just sort it by, uh, I think you can sort by the buy, hold, and sell decisions. All of the buys will come out at the top and the holes in the middle, and then the sales at the bottom. And then you can create a, a, a portfolio that says sell candidates and, and then add those uh, companies to that portfolio if that the way you want to do it, but mm -hmm. I think just having them in your regular portfolio, you can still identify them, mm -hmm. but if you want them in a separate place, you can just 
create, you know, name your portfolio, uh, sell candidates or sell companies or something like that, and mm -hmm. then just add the uh, the ticker symbol for that portfolio. You probably have to put in the, you know, the number of shares and everything like you do for a regular portfolio. Well, and one caveat to to this, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you hit this, but this the, I think this bears repeating, even if you have. Um, when you do their studies, make sure they're current. So if something's been studied maybe a year or so ago, and it's a cell candidate, then um, you uh, you might want to make sure your numbers and your judgment is updated because it could change that indication. Yep. And uh, a recommendation is that you update uh, your uh, individual portfolio, uh, individual stocks at least once a quarter. Mm -hmm. When you get ready to do your review, at least once a quarter. Now, if you're in a club, I, I guess you have to update them once a month, at least the uh, prices and the data on that uh, data button to refresh. And mm -hmm. I always select, select update the uh, price and the data. And uh, you should catch the quarterly updates if you do it monthly. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll, they'll roll around every three or four months, uh, well, depending on when the data is available. Right. Yeah, depending on where you get your data. Um, and I know Value Line redoes every company they follow every 13 weeks. So they'll do it up to four times a year which is a great time to, to redo your SSG. And, and that's kind of another incentive as, to far, as far as um, comparing your judgment to the value line analyst and see where you come out and if you see, see if you agree with them or you disagree with them. And I think you get your value line information uh, a little faster than we get the uh, Morningstar uh, up, updates. Okay. It could be. All right. Yeah, Yuval, if, um, if you want to clarify any of that, uh, feel free if you want to come off mute and, uh, you know, make any comments on that. Okay. Hello. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I didn't know I can, uh, I can uh, disrupt, but uh, thank you for the, for the lecture. It was great. The question I have is, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, okay. The question I have is, I have SSG plus, okay? And I have a tab with the, all the study that I, I made so far, which uh, may be 50 or more. Now, on the, on the top of the study, I mean, I can even show you my screen if, 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 if it's possible. Uh, it's okay to share my screen or? Yeah, that's fine. Um, Howard, you'd have to stop sharing, I think. Okay. okay. What I need, new share? Uh, you can just stop share. You should have a stop share button. It should be red. Is it at the top or at the bottom? Probably at the bottom. Probably right, right underneath where you are. Right in the middle should say stop sharing. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I might be able to make you stop. Let me see if I can. You have a button in red that says stop sharing. There you go. All right, go ahead. Okay. So, okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I have all these studies. And now here I have a, I have all studies and I have a, a two portfolios. Now the question is how do I select like one, like let's say this one, this one, this one, and put them together here, for example. You want to add those to an existing portfolio? Yes, in the same time, though, 
because yeah basically yes i don't think you can do them at the same time you cannot huh well i'm wondering so. whether whether that pencil up next to the wind because here yeah. yeah i mean okay let's say I, i'm adding that one okay and then just like that you do it yeah yeah oh, okay yeah yeah they had them one at a time now once uh, you, one one of the time okay yeah but once you click that save button it'll save all of them to that portfolio at one time but yeah you you have to add them one by one just like that okay yeah and once i finish i can go to to here for example and do reports and then yeah. What we talked about, yeah? Okay. Yeah, that's right. All right. Good job. <laughs> Good job. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm disconnecting. All right. So there was another question um, that if a stock is, is negative, um, so if a stock is negative, which I think that means if they've got negative um, fundamentals, sales and earnings, I'm guessing, um, or the stock price, I'm not sure which one, but if a stock is negative for three quarters, would you consider selling it at that point? You know, uh, two, two meetings ago that we talked about that actually, the torpedoes and all that stuff, Bill, we did do a presentation about that. Mm -hmm. No, I think this was, uh, I don't know if Howard, if you want to weigh in on this one um, and whether this, is, because this kind of turns into a personal judgment like your SSGs is what is that magic, you know, time frame where you have patience with a stock versus, okay, you've crossed my line. Now it's time to sell. Well, Declining uh, indicators for three quarters would cause me to take a good look at it. It's not a, it's not an automatic sale, and then it'll depend a lot on the decree the degree of the that decline, and then what the company is saying about that decline. Um, if you've been following that company for a while, you can you know, make a informed judgment as to whether uh, that's a danger, you know, like the one we were looking at with uh, Microsoft, is this a long-term indicator of bad news or if it's just a temporary indicator of bad news? Like back during the COVID crisis, a lot of companies had three quarters of uh, declining revenue and pre-tax profit and earnings per, per, per share, but they were still good companies, but the situation caused them to have negative numbers. And once, you know, the, the economy turned around and people started going back out, things turned back up. Now, uh, you, you could say you can sell after three quarters and buy back in once it hit bottom but who knows when it's going to hit bottom right. so you can't you can't try to time the market you've got to look at those fundamentals and kind of see what's the reason behind it now if it's uh you know all of their patents are starting to expire and they don't have any new drugs in the pipeline might be a time to jump ship but you've got to look at that company as a whole and uh, make your judgment then uh, based on all of the available information. But uh, three quarters, I would take a look at it if it's been going down for three quarters. Mm -hmm. But I've had companies like that that I did not sell and uh, they did turn around. And I've had companies like that where I did sell them and they still turned around. Yeah. 
Right. And I think I would add to that, in addition to take a good hard look at the company and the fundamentals, um, like you said, whether there's a COVID situation kind of thing going on, um, you may also want to take a look at the industry and the market as a whole to see if there's other factors that are impacting companies that, you know, may not be the company's fault. You know, companies have been uh, suffering through this uh, supply chain situation recently. Mm -hmm. They haven't been able to get, you know, all the materials they need to manufacture their products. So their sales have gone down as a result. So is that the company's fault? So it's different things you have to look at. And, and that's why, you know, knowing your companies is uh, uh, very important. Yep. Um, question was asked, what numbers should we look at? Sales, earnings per, earnings per uh, EPS, earnings per sales, earning per, um, and growth? Or is there other things to, to monitor? Well, the main three of those are on the uh, the graph, but there are others. There's there's an infinite number of uh, uh, numbers you can look at, but the main three are sales, pre-tax profit, and earnings per share. Those are the the main stage. But even on our stock selection guide. You've got, uh, you can highlight different uh, numbers over there on the legend. You can look at dividends, you can look at cash flow, you can look at uh, what else is over there? I, I, I take a look at debt sometimes to see what they're, how yep. they're managing their debt. Mm -hmm. So it's any number of uh, indicators you can look at, but uh, you can look at how their PE is going up or down over time. But uh, like I said, the main three of those uh, sales, pre-tax profit, and earnings. And I always like to uh, quote my mentor uh, here in the Georgia chapter. He's, he's uh, uh, no longer with the chapter, but when I first joined back in 2000, he recruited me as a director and his name was Billy Williams. He said, 80% of what you need to know to make a decision as to whether you're gonna purchase a stock is on the front and the back of the stock selection guide. That's 80%. So you can get another 10% uh, from reading the company's uh, annual report the uh, uh, management discussion and analysis, that'll give you another 10%. And then you can run all over the internet trying to get that last 10%. Yeah. Well, and you said um, that would be 80% on when to buy. And I would say it'd probably be 80% on when to buy or sell, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I said, I said when you're making a decision. Decision, okay. And, yeah, 80% to make that decision is on the stock selection guide. Yep. And and uh, really, it, he says, if you look at that uh, that graph and uh, it's all over the place, <laughs> stop, move on. <laughs> You're wasting your time going past that graph if it's all over the place. Yep. Okay. All right. I think we're caught up with the questions in the chat. So if there's any last minute questions anybody has, otherwise I'll turn it back to Chris. Okay. I think there's nothing left for us to do except to thank everyone for coming out. We really, we love doing these. And we're certainly open to any suggestions that you all have about what our future topics should be. And of course, at any given time, we can change, you know, the topic can become your topic because you're invited to speak and ask whatever question you like. Um, Anna, did you want to pose your question again now that we have more people here? 
Sorry, that was a little choppy, Chris. Say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hmm, interesting. I, I'm plugged in too. I should think that this thing would be nice and clear. I apologize. Um, Anna, did you want to ask your question again? Okay, well, I want to thank everyone so much for coming. And we will see you all. We do these the, the third Wednesday of every odd month. So this month, we're in number five. Our next one will be July. And we look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>